So welcome to this uh, video. I'm hoping this is going to be a series of videos about the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now this little device only came out a couple of days ago and I only received mine in the post this morning. What I want to do in this video is have a look at what this device is and have a little history lesson on what items have gone before it. Now this video won't be to everybody's taste so sorry about that. Uh, the most popular videos I have seem to be about me uh, doing work on my Astra, which I don't like doing. Um, I much prefer doing microchips. So the first microcontroller I'm going to look at is the PIC, and it's the microchip PIC. I started using these about 20 years ago, and they were all the rage at the time. So to write a program for these, you'd actually use assembly language. Now, this chip has actually only 35 instructions that it recognises. And when you programmed it, you would actually use those instructions to program it. So you'd have to open a text editor, normally Notepad, and you'd write your program. And for example, if you wanted to write, if you wanted to turn on an LED, you would have to put bit set file, BSF, you would then have to say which file you were going to set the bit of, and that is port B, which is number 6. And then you would have to say which bit of that file you wanted to set, which, you know, for example, might be 0. So bit set file 6, 0 would be turn on the LED connected to port B, 0. If you wanted to turn it off, you'd then bit clear file, and so on. Um, to actually load the program in, to the PIC, you would write the program, you then open MS-DOS, and then you would have to compile the program, and then while you're still in MS-DOS, you would have to send the program to the PIC using a parallel port on the back of your computer. So it's beginning to show you how old this is, because most computers do not have a parallel port, it's all gone USB and serial. But that's how we used to do PICs. Now it didn't stay like that for long, so after a little while of um, programming PICs in assembly language, um, which gave me a really good understanding of how PICs actually work, because you're actually using the instructions from the instruction set, um, I then treated myself to a prototyping board, as you can see here. And this is really useful because it allows you to put any one of the PICs onto the board and then use any of the other devices that you can see on the board to test it. So I have all the buttons down here for inputs, I have LEDs for outputs, I have graphical LCD, I have a number LCD, I have a seven segment displays here, and so on. So this was a really useful board, but more importantly, this board was then able to be programmed using USB, and the programming environment was also a lot more easy to use, and I decided at that time to use BASIC. At some stage, I came across the Arduino. Now the Arduino is um, very similar to the PIC microchips. However, it's how it is presented and how it is programmed that makes it more user-friendly. The environment you use is used by millions of people around the world who share their code. So if you wanted to do a particular thing, on an Arduino Uno, you'll probably find that somebody else has already done it and they've shared their code. And they write sections of code called libraries. So it makes it a very usable item. The other thing that makes it very usable is they're open source so they're allowed to be cloned. But they should all have this same format. And that format allows you to add what they call shields to them. A Raspberry Pi it's called a hat, on an Arduino board it's called a shield. So for example, if I put this one on, it gives me three input buttons, it gives me a buzzer, it gives me seven segment display, it gives me four LEDs. So that little board which just pushes on top allows me to do a lot of prototyping. The other thing, for example, if I wanted to maybe try an LCD display, somebody has made a shield for that. So you can just put that on top of the uh, Arduino Uno and 
somebody will have shared the code to program this. Uh, there are lots of shields available for this and a lot of people use this around the world. And that's quite important, I think, for the Raspberry Pi. So the next one I want to show you is this. Now I don't really like this, I have to be honest. This is the micro bit from BBC. This was given out to kids a couple of years ago and uh, it was hoped that it would uh, get a lot of kids into programming. Now I'm not sure it's actually worked because I think this is quite limited. Yes, it has lots of sensors on it and it has 25 LEDs on the back. Um, but I don't find it that user friendly and I don't think it's got the following as the Arduino has. Now whilst I don't really like this micro bit, I have to be honest, it has a couple of nice features that make it user friendly. The first is how you actually program it. You connect it via USB and then you drag and drop the program into a folder which shows up on your drive. You also have the option of programming this board via Bluetooth on your phone. So it makes it quite easy to program. The other thing is you have several programming options for this, including Python. So it opens up quite a lot more languages to be used with this device. So before I look at the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, Pico, I'm just gonna have a look at the three items and just do a bit of a comparison with them. So to start with the microchip, I think they are more suited to um, somebody who's um, better at programming uh, microcontrollers. Um, and what they would do is generally select the chip that suits their project and then they would program that chip on a uh, programmer and then use it in their circuit. Uh, the chips can be um, or cost anywhere between uh, under £2 to upwards and it depends on what uh, peripherals you want or what you want included within that chip. So now we move on to the Arduino board um, and I think it's fair to replace the Uno with a Nano and the Nano, if you don't know, is a very small board. I don't know if that's focusing, focus, there you go. So that board is basically the same processor as the Uno but it's on a smaller footprint and uh, they work out about the same price, you can get them for around £3.70. Um, the Nano and the Uno uh, are uh, running at 60 megahertz, they have eight 10-bit analog to digital pins, one I squared C interface, and then about 14 digital pins of which six can be used as pulse width modulation. Um, so they're quite a flexible board to use. Um, now we move on to the micro bit. I don't think it's really fair to compare it, although from what I can tell it uses a very similar or maybe even the same processor. Um, it obviously includes all the items on the board and it's kind of a standalone unit, whereas the Nano and the Pico, you're going to have to add bits to it. Um, it does run at 60 megahertz, which seems a bit slow. Um, it does actually have the 32-bit ARM Cortex M0 processor, which um, seems to be the same as the Raspberry Pi, which runs at 133 megahertz. Yeah. So let's have a quick look at the stats on the uh, Raspberry Pi Pico. Okay, so this is a second attempt at this part of the video. The first time I recorded it, I said something not quite correctly. So I've got it up on the computer, I'm using a screen recorder. Um, you can see here it has uh, 40 pins, and uh, they are all spaced out 0.1 of an inch apart. So you can use your header on that. Um, across this way, the width is actually uh, 0.7 of an inch, um, which means you can't use a chip holder. Um, that's a bit of a missed opportunity, I think. So we have a large number of uh, general purpose I.O., which are the green ones. There are 26 in total. So we also have special functions. Uh, one of these is the UART, and you can see we have two UART channels. There's a 0 and a 1. And uh, they're also available in different locations around the chip, but you still only have the two channels. So one is available here, here, and that's it, and then zero is available on this side as well, over here and over there. And it's um, the same with the I squared C, you have only two I squared C channels, um, a zero and a one, and they are available all the way around the chip. Um, and it's the same with SPI, you only have the two channels of SPI. 
Now, when I originally uh, recorded this, I said there were four analog to digital channels. There are actually only three available on the Pico board. Uh, they're actually the chip itself has four channels, but one of them's used internally, or one of them's used to measure the board voltage or something. So the CPU is a 32-bit dual-core ARM Cortex M0, and it actually runs at 48 megahertz, but it is configurable up to 133 megahertz, and has 264 kilobytes of SRAM in six independently configured banks. How wonderful! Um, and then there's two megabytes of external flash RAM storage. So what doesn't show on this picture is the pulse width. Uh, there are eight slices of pulse width. I think that actually means there are 16 channels. And like the uh, UR and the uh, I squared C, they are available all around the chip, but you need to be very careful that you don't uh, inadvertently select one on this side and one on the other side, which are actually the same channel. Uh, one of the general purpose IO pins is missing from the edge. In fact, there's a couple missing from the edge, and that is because it's used to light the LED in this top corner. And that's very useful for debugging. Um, so I haven't actually got to testing this yet. I only received it this morning. Uh, I just checked on the website; and they've already run out. Um, so I'm actually going to read the book and work out how to get this running, and that will be my next video. So if you want to see that next video, please subscribe and thank you for watching.